The Tushan ran into difficulty almost as soon as leaving the River Clyde, bound for Shanghai. She was taking on water due to what was suspected by those on board to be due to a flaw in her riveting. And while in the St. George's Channel, one of her paddle wheels was also damaged. They stopped in Waterford for repairs, but Captain Johnson was still not satisfied. He turned around, having decided the best course of action would be to go back to the shipyard that had just finished building the ship for a refit before he dared the long voyage to Shanghai. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? The poorly built Shushan. Here we are. Enjoy! The Shushan's construction by John Elder and company in Govan, Scotland, was described as having been quick, and her build was described as unusual. She was intended for the Chinese Steam Navigation Company for their China trade, and so they had not built her in the style of the ships that generally made their appearance around the United Kingdom. Instead, they built the 3,590-ton iron-wheeled paddle steamship with a large beam engine set high on the deck. She was described in many cases as being American-style, but from other references, it can be assumed that this was a reference to American riverboats specifically. Indeed, her engine had been brought over from America, salvaged from the last ship that had borne the name Tushan. The Tushan was also not completely fitted out. It was intended for her to be completely finished once she reached China. This was not the first ship that had been built in such a manner. The Tushan had a sister ship called the Qiangtin that was built on the same model and had arrived in Shanghai in 1870, though by different builders. She would go on to enjoy a career of over 50 years. The Tushan was completed on the 17th of September, and during her sea trial showed a speed of 10 knots. Satisfied with their new ship, she left the River Clyde on the 10th of October, carrying on board only the 1,000 tons of coal she would need for fuel. She had a crew of 46 men, including the captain. Captain Johnson had decided to bring along his wife, four-year-old son, and his wife's sister, who was officially on the crew list as a steward. Another sea captain, Captain King, was also on board, though, as a passenger, since he had a position waiting for him in China. They intended to go by way of the Suez Canal, but they never made it past Ireland. Almost as soon as they started their voyage, they could tell that there was some problems with the riveting on the ship, perhaps due to the speed of her construction. Then, with a paddle wheel damaged in St. George's Channel, they turned into Waterford for some repairs. Still not content with the condition of the ship, and having been told in Waterford that they were not seaworthy, they turned back to Govan on the 20th of October, with a wind coming from the northwest. She traveled well until she got to the northwest of the Irish coast, when the wind shifted and began to blow from the southwest, and it began to rain. Knowing that they should not remain so close to the Irish coast in such weather, they altered course, but the weather was changing into a gale. By Wednesday, the 21st of October, they could begin to feel some of the flaws of their ship's design. Her breadth of beam exposed a lot of surface to be pounded by the rough sea, and she began to steer badly, hardly answering her helm at all. Despite all of their efforts, they were now getting close to the Ayrshire coast, and it was beginning to seem doubtful that they would be able to make the mouth of the Clyde. By the light of the ironworks on shore, the pilot on board, a Mr. Moyer of Greenock, was able to determine their location, and he and Captain Johnson decided to make a run for the safety of Arjosen Harbor. Their ship had already been determined to not be seaworthy. They were concerned that if they remained on the open sea in such rough weather, their ship would go to pieces. Outside of Arjosen Harbor was a known danger, Krynan Rock 
which was a well-known navigation hazard. In case ships were not aware of it, a lighthouse stood near it to warn them, as well as a beacon on the rock. No matter how many warnings those on board the Tucson had, however, there was little that they could do to avoid it, with their ships steering as poor as it was. They had tried adding some sails to try to add to the ship's ability to steer, so that she was not fully dependent on steam, but this proved to be a useless gesture, and the ship crashed with full force into Crinan Rock, in sight of the people who had been watching anxiously on shore around five or six in the morning of the 21st of October. Mr. Moyer, the pilot on board the Tushan, would describe the moments leading up to the wreck later. They were heading into the harbor from the southwest, and the wind was carrying them to leeward no matter what efforts they made. The waves kept pounding on her big paddle boxes and the coverings over her boiler and buffeting her off course even as they tried to point her safely into the harbor. Out of desperation, Moyer ordered the ship's engine work alternating ahead and astern, so that they could wiggle into the harbor broadside. He would later defend the decision by saying that it seemed as though it would have worked if it was not for a mechanical problem of the Tushan, though he could not be certain if it was due to a mechanical failure or a design oversight. The engine did not work reversely by steam, and so the valves had to be done manually. This caused delays in the maneuver, and this proved to be costly. While they were operating in this way, a large sea crashed into them and carried them into Crinan Rock, completely helpless to fight against the force of the storm. As they struck, they knocked off the beacon that had stood on Crinan Rock to warn them of the danger. For the people on shore, it was a moment of horror. They had been concerned about the ship even as it approached, which was why so many people had been watching her. They had assumed it was a local ship that would know the waters well but that did not offer them much comfort in the terrible gale. It was not a good harbor to try to enter in a storm. Even worse, some of the regular members of their life-saving crew were members of the Coast Guard, and they were away on drills in a different district. As the ship crashed into Crinan Rock, no one was certain how they would be able to reach them to assist them. Moyer and those on board assumed that when the ship struck the rock, the ship which had struck stern first, would be gutted by the rock, and also stuck fast on it. Instead, the Tushan split apart, splitting apart exactly where the flaw had been found by the people who had inspected her in Waterford, and declared her to be unfit to sail. Their determination had proven to be prophetic. The aft of the ship sank, with only the bridge and the masts remaining above water, while the bow of the ship floated into the harbor. The bow of the Tushan was described as traveling between the breakwaters, going up to the top of the harbor, and being carried by momentum and the tide to rest right in between two other vessels, as though it had been steered there. Unfortunately for those who had been on board the Tushan, many of them were in the stern of the vessel, or they had been flung into the water when the ship split apart. Three men who were in their berths at the forward part of the ship found themselves close to other ships and two of them managed to reach safety, though the third was swept away by the sea. The lifeboat at Ardrosan was getting ready to go out, but since it was missing the Coast Guardsmen, replacements had to be found for that part of the crew. There was also no one to operate the rocket due to their absence, so firing a line to the wreck was out of the question. The pilot, Mr. Moyer, would later say that it was his opinion that if a line had been fired to the wreck, everyone would have been saved. As it was, the lifeboat had to be the thing that they pinned all their hopes on, and even after a crew was found, the lifeboat had some struggles. There would be much debate in the aftermath about how efficient the lifeboat had been. There were many accusations, especially from those who had been on the Tushan that there had been a long delay before rescue had arrived. The crew of the lifeboat said that it had taken them only a few minutes to get ready, and that they had been alongside the wreck in the space of half an hour. 
They would have been there sooner, but they had not been able to get out of the harbor under the power of oars, and they had been forced to call for the harbor's steam tug to tow them to the ship, which had taken more time. Under the tow of the steam tug, the lifeboat was successfully brought to the wreck, and they saved some of the people who were on the wreck, but the steam tug proved far more efficient in the work. Nine of the crew were clinging to the rigging of the ship. Mr. Moyer, who had been standing at his post until the ship wrecked, was among their number. The tug, under the command of Captain Ballantyne, could not get too close to the wreck without putting themselves in danger, so instead they threw lines to each man individually, and then drew them in to safety. Moyer was the last man who was brought safely from the rigging of the ship, and would estimate that he clung to the mast for approximately two hours before he was pulled onto the tug. This did not mean that the tug neglected those in the water. They threw ropes to anyone they could see floating in the water. The captain's wife was clinging to a boom from the ship, while also holding onto her four-year-old son. Twice, a sailor who was hanging onto the same boom was forced to rescue the child at risk of his own life, as he washed from her arms by the fury of the storm. When it came time for the tug to attempt the rescue of the captain and his family, Captain Johnson securely lashed his wife and son to the line. And Captain Ballantyne would say that Captain Johnson had taken an active role in holding his wife above the water as they were pulled through the water. On realizing that the man on the tug was not strong enough to pull the three of them to safety, Captain Johnson chose the path of sacrifice. Releasing his hold on the rope so that his wife and son could be brought up to the deck of the tug, while he slipped beneath the sea. The passenger, Captain King, had also been clinging to the boom of the ship, but a wave had smashed him down to the deck. He grabbed a piece of the wreckage to use as a flotation device as he was swept into the water. He intended to swim to shore in this way, but the tug spotted him, and he was pulled to safety. There is no exact count of how many the lifeboats saved. They only said a few, but the tug saved nine from the wreck and six from the water. In some cases, those who had been wrecked managed to bring themselves to safety, clinging to pieces of wreckage until they reached the shore or the pier, and were pulled up by those who had been watching the events unfold with horror. The people on shore could also see that there was still a man on board the stern part of the Chushan, trapped in the wreckage. Four of the people on shore, all local laborers, decided they could no longer stand to watch, and they took a small boat out to the wreck with the intention of trying to save him. They managed to get a line to him, but he could not be pulled free, and over and over the waves crashed over him, hiding him from their sight. They were still trying when he turned to one side and disappeared from their view forever. In total, 17 people would be lost, and the Tushan would spend some time crumpled at the entrance of Ardrosan as a stark reminder of the tragedy. Her wreck was purchased for salvage since it was made completely of iron, but almost a year later it still was not completely removed. There would be an inquiry both an official one and one in the court of public opinion. Many people were shocked by the shortcomings of the Chushan, but they were also horrified by the lack of swift and efficient life-saving methods from Ardrosan. It was a harbor that the pilot Moyer described as being dangerous to enter, even when there was no storm. It was a place that people hoped would be ready to save the shipwreck at any moment. Many people felt that if there had been fewer delays, most, if not all, of the people on board of the Tushan could have been saved. The official finding focused far more on the concerns with ships built in the style of the Tushan. They voiced that it was their hope that the Tushan would stand as an example to people who built ships of her class, not to allow them to sail, unless it was a season when they were unlikely to encounter storms. No blame was placed on Captain Johnson and instead, he was remembered by Captain Ballantyne in his account as someone whose last action had been to hold his wife up to the tugboat with one last effort to bring her to safety. 
a monument with a relief of the Tushan, was erected in the cemetery in Ardrosan, in memory of those who were lost. The four laborers had gone out in the small boat when even the lifeboat had not been able to get out of the harbor under its own power. All received medals for their effort. It was acknowledged that, though they were not successful in their mission, that they had tried at all, in spite of the obvious risk for their own safety. It was something deserving of recognition. For more information, please see Great Shipwrecks, A Record of Perils and Disasters at Sea by William Henry Davenport Adams, published in 1877, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.